Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. As the seasons change and it begins to get closer to winter, we often see geese flying in formation as many are winging their way to a warmer climate. They often cover thousands of miles as they fly to their destination. There have been many fascinating facts discovered about their V-shaped flight pattern as well as their in-flight habits. One of these interesting facts is that as each goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the birds that follow. By flying in a V formation, the flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each goose flew on its own. Those in front rotate their leadership. When the lead goose tires, it rotates back into the formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. And another takes its place and flies point. The geese in the rear of the formation are the ones who do the honking. It's thought that the repeated honks encourage those up front to stay at it and also to announce their presence and that all is well. When one goose gets sick or wounded, often two fall out of formation with it and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with the struggler until it's able to fly again. It is the natural instinct of geese to work together. And whether they are rotating, flapping, helping, or simply honking, the flock is in it together, which enables them to accomplish what they set out to do. The Apostle Paul did not serve alone. He needed the help, service, and encouragement of others in the body of Christ to accomplish what God sent him to do as the Apostle of the Gentiles. And serving with others, Paul got more accomplished than he ever would have alone. In Paul's letters and in the book of Acts, we find numerous people who served alongside Paul. And Paul was always quick to recognize and commend their labors for Christ. Paul's associates are referred to by a variety of terms, including brother, minister, fellow laborer, fellow servant, fellow soldier, fellow prisoner. These terms describe the different ways and circumstances that they ministered with the apostle. We'll begin a series of looking at Paul's co-workers, and we'll begin with one of Paul's earliest and most prominent companions in ministry, Barnabas. Acts 4, 36-37 read, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is, being interpreted, the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. In Acts 4, we are introduced to Barnabas. He is introduced in light of those who had been saved and added to the kingdom church at Pentecost, and them having all things common. This act was done in the power of the Holy Spirit, and manifested his supernatural ministry among those kingdom believers at that time. Verses 34 and 35 of this chapter read, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. In verse 36, we learn that among those who were possessors of land and sold it, was Joseph, surnamed Barnabas. Barnabas' given name was Joseph. His parents named him after one of the heroes of the Jews in their history. This is the only time Barnabas is referred to as Joseph. Barnabas was a Jew and a Levite, or from the tribe of Levi. But Joseph was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles. Barnabas was a nickname given to Joseph. Nicknames often stick, and it did with Barnabas, as from this point on, he's only mentioned by his surname in Scripture. 
Nicknames often tell us something about the individual, such as Honest Abe, or Doubting Thomas, or even Ivan the Terrible. And the meaning of Barnabas' nickname tells us something about him as well. Verse 36 gives the definition of Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. We see other examples in Scripture where surnames are given, which denote a person's character or something characteristic about them. In Mark 3, 16 to 17, we read, And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Simon was surnamed Peter by the Lord, meaning a rock or a stone, referring to his resoluteness and steadfastness in life. John and James were surnamed Boanerges, or the sons of thunder, referring to their fiery disposition. And for Barnabas, he was the son of consolation or encouragement. Consolation is the Greek word parakaleo. It has the idea of coming to the aid or assistance of another. One commentator said this about the meaning of this word. It's the picture of a weary traveler stumbling down the highway with a heavy load on his shoulders. His head is low, his shoulders stooped, his knees wobbly, his feet barely moving. Each step is an agony. As you watch him, he staggers and begins to fall. You can see that he will never make it. So you rush from your place, come alongside, and you lift the load from his shoulders and place it on your own. Then you put your arm around him and say, It's all right, brother. I'll help you make it. And together you walk on down the road. That's what the word consolation is teaching. It's about coming alongside another to help them in their moment of need. It is the ability to lift the load from a brother or sister and help them along their way. Barnabas exemplified Romans 15, 1 and 2, which says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. In this, we can all be like Barnabas and have a ministry of consolation, supporting, lifting burdens, counseling and encouraging others. The church needs this. William Barclay wrote, One of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to laugh at men's ideas. It is easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It is easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time, a word of praise or thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. You see the character of Barnabas in seeking to meet the needs of others by him having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet, as verse 37 says. Barnabas was from the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. In biblical times, Cyprus was famous for its wine, wheat, oil, figs, and honey. To possess land there was significant and meant one was likely rich and influential. But Barnabas sold his land. Barnabas's gift is singled out here, likely because of the spirit in which his generous gift was given. Without reserve, he held nothing back, and he freely gave it all. Barnabas was generous, unselfish, and willing to give all the proceeds from the land sale to have all things common with others in the kingdom church. And he did so also because the gospel of the kingdom required one to sell all that they had at that time. We also see Barnabas' character of encouragement and support and how he treated the apostle Paul after he was saved. After Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, he had a three-year ministry in Damascus. Following this, a plot was formed to kill Paul. The believers in Damascus then let him down the wall of Damascus in a basket to escape the plot to take his life. It is after this that Acts 9, 26 to 27 reads, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, 
but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. When Paul left Damascus, he went to Jerusalem. The last time Paul had been in Jerusalem was before his conversion three years earlier. Thus, the last time he was there, he had been viciously persecuting believers, dragging them out of their homes, arresting and putting them in prison, having people beaten and put to death for their faith in Christ and his resurrection. Now he returns to Jerusalem a changed man a believer who had been completely transformed by Jesus Christ. And when he tried to join himself to fellow believers, they were afraid of him, and they doubted, and they were skeptical that he truly had become a follower of Christ. Because after all, in their thinking, it would have been, what better way to destroy the church than to fake a conversion, infiltrate the ranks, gain the trust of the leadership, and then throw them all in jail? But it's at this point that Barnabas, the son of consolation, enters the scene to help and support Paul. And Barnabas brought Paul to the apostles and reassured them that Paul's conversion to Christ was genuine and that he had seen and spoken with the risen Lord. He further pointed out that Paul had been ministering and fearlessly preaching Christ in Damascus for a number of years. Barnabas was quick to respond to a human need. And with courageous kindness here, he stood up for Paul and spoke up in his favor when those in Jerusalem were fearful and wanting nothing to do with Paul. And Barnabas stood by Paul until he turned the tide of opinion in Jerusalem in Paul's favor and they accepted him. And by this account, we see that Barnabas was just as generous with his compassion as he had been with his money. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Galatians, Law versus Grace is a hardcover 329-page commentary written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamm, founder of the Berean Bible Society. This volume is a comprehensive study on the unique character of Paul's apostleship and message. Pastor Stamm effectively shows how legalism had sapped the spiritual vitality of the Galatians and the course of action the apostle took to deal with the matter. The book takes a fresh new look at a number of age-old problems. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Acts 11, 21 to 26 read, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. As God's work among the Gentiles was growing in Antioch and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord, this news reached Jerusalem. The church then sent a representative to investigate 
and that representative was Barnabas. In this, we see his willingness to do whatever was needed in ministry and to go wherever he was sent. Coming to Antioch and seeing the grace of God in action with souls being saved and the word of God working in the lives of Greeks in Antioch, verse 23 says Barnabas was glad. You see Barnabas' priorities and heart for ministry and helping people that he was glad to see the spiritual awakening and the grace of God at work in the lives of those in Antioch. Verse 24 states of Barnabas, For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. A man once tried to organize a hide-and-seek tournament, but it was a complete failure because good players are really hard to find. Barnabas was a good man, and good men can be hard to find. Barnabas did what was right and good in God's sight. He was a godly, upright, benevolent, honorable, humble man of God. And he was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. Being full of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit was evident in his life. Thus, he was a man of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. The Holy Ghost had sovereign sway in his heart. The Spirit governed and guided him and used his life. Barnabas was a Spirit-filled man who was a man of faith. And as a man of faith, he trusted the Lord implicitly. He knew that God could not lie and that his word could not fail. He trusted that God is faithful and always present. And by faith, he relied on the Lord for his help, his light, power, and wisdom in his ministry. And through his ministry, much people was added unto the Lord. That verse is a wonderful testimony to the grace of God at work in Barnabas' life. And it is a verse to have as a goal for ourselves, that it might be true of us too, that many people might be added to the Lord through our life and efforts for Christ. Much people being added to the Lord was the direct consequence of Barnabas' good testimony and the power of the Holy Spirit working through Barnabas' faith. And in the wisdom of the Spirit, as the church at Antioch began to grow larger and larger, Barnabas realized that he needed help to minister most effectively. And when Barnabas saw the growing work in Antioch and many Greeks believing and desiring the word, his thought went to Paul and of Paul's commission to the Gentiles. And in that we see the honorable character of Barnabas. He does not think of himself here. Because here he was leading a thriving, growing ministry, but he did not wish to build the work up around himself or to lift up himself. Instead, selflessly, Barnabas thought to find Paul and Tarsus and bring him to Antioch and give the Gentiles in Antioch the benefit of Paul's teaching and the truth of the message of God's grace toward the Gentiles that was revealed to Paul from Christ for this age. Thus Barnabas departed for Tarsus, where Paul had been for around six years. He found Paul there and brought him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, this duo worked with the church in Antioch, teaching a great many people. Acts 13 verses 1 to 4 read, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Barnabas is listed here with men who were prophets and teachers. This tells us that Barnabas had the ability by the Spirit, as others in the early church did prior to the scriptures being complete, to receive revelation and speak the inspired word of God as a prophet. 
And as a teacher, Barnabas could also expound on and explain God's word and revelation to others in a simple and understandable manner. As Paul and Barnabas were ministering in Antioch, the Holy Spirit separated them out from the others in the church to send them on an apostolic journey. These two men had already formed a powerful ministry team in Antioch, and now the Spirit called this team to take God's truth of grace to the world. John Levere wrote, Compared to this voyage and its results, the voyages of Columbus, Magellan, and others count for little. For this voyage marked the beginning of the sending forth of God's message of grace to all the world. On this journey, Paul and Barnabas first traveled to the island of Cyprus. And that's not without significance because Barnabas was from Cyprus. This was familiar territory for him. Barnabas had family and connections there and was a logical place for beginning their journey and journey and sharing the gospel of God's grace. From Cyprus, their journey took them up to the region of southern Galatia, where they visited Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and established churches there. The labors of Paul and Barnabas on this journey together were marked by triumphs of the gospel and trials and per persecutions as well. Throughout their journey, Paul and Barnabas faced persecution from the Jews who stirred up the people in opposition against them and against Paul's message of grace. Paul wrote of this time in 2 Timothy 3.11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, or Antioch of Pisidia, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. At the end of his first apostolic journey, Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, their sending church. And after returning to Antioch, men came to the church teaching the requirement of circumcision for Gentiles to be saved. This led to Paul and Barnabas going up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. There, both Paul and Barnabas declared what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them as they gave witness to the great things God had done among the people of the nations through their ministry on that apostolic journey. And at the crucial council in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas stood firm for the truth of Gentile liberty from the law. Paul wrote in Galatians, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. As a result of the council, James, Peter, and John gave to me, that is Paul and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Galatians 2 verses 11 to 13 read, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Following the Jerusalem council, two negative events took place between Paul and Barnabas. You hate to end on a bad note with Barnabas because he was such an important co-worker with Paul during the earlier part of his ministry, but Barnabas was a man. And while he was a good man, he was not a perfect man, and he failed here in Galatians 2. Uh, the first example we have here was when Peter traveled to Antioch to visit the church. While there, he was eating with some Gentiles, which was not a problem with God's change in programs, and this was completely acceptable to God. And Peter had learned earlier in the case of Cornelius and eating with those Gentiles in Acts 10 that it wasn't a problem. But while they were there eating with Gentiles in Antioch, as Peter had every right to do, word came 
that a group of Jews was coming from James to Antioch. As soon as the announcement was made, a separation took place among these Jews and Gentiles who had been enjoying each other's fellowship. Peter immediately withdrew, fearing those of the circumcision or the Jews who were coming from James, afraid that they would carry the report back to James that he was eating with Gentiles. As a result of Peter's actions, the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation, which literally means hypocrisy. Surprisingly, Barnabas followed Peter in his hypocritical separation from the Gentiles, making them seem unclean when they are not unclean under grace. And in this, Barnabas made a mistake. He should have stood his ground. Also, after the Jerusalem Council, Barnabas wanted to take his family member, John Mark, on their second apostolic journey. On their first apostolic journey, John Mark began the journey with Paul and Barnabas, but then during the trip, he deserted them and returned home. Barnabas, ever the encourager, wanted to give John Mark a second chance after his failure, but Paul was not willing to do that. As a result, Acts 15, 39 to 40 reads, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed. Their disagreement was so sharp that each decided to go their own way. Paul and Barnabas stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and engaged in a disagreement so heated that in the end they could no longer work together. And that is the last time, then, you read about Barnabas in Acts. When Paul and Barnabas did work together in the power of the Spirit, they were a powerful team as they spread the gospel of the grace of God. Barnabas was a big-hearted, zealous man of the truth who cared for lost souls and was an encourager of the church. And there's much that we can learn from his example. And this testimony of him, of him in Scripture is one each of us should strive for in the power of the Spirit. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And by his life and ministry, much people was added unto the Lord. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.